All right, what's up everybody? This is Matthew. Thanks for checking into the channel. Today we're going to talk about open versus closed communion and whether or not there may be another way. Think for a moment with me about your own church and its practice and how it is that the elements are distributed on any given uh, participation in the Lord's Supper at your church, whether you commune weekly or monthly or quarterly, whatever it is, who is available, who is able, who is permitted to come to the Lord's table? Well, that's the question in discussion today. You know, there's a couple of main views here. One of them is called open communion and the other is called closed communion for obvious reasons. Let's talk about a little bit the virtues and perhaps the weaknesses of both of those views. Starting with closed table communion, what exactly is that? Well, closed table communion is the idea that pretty much only the members of a particular local church are really permitted to come to the Lord's table. Now, we can expand closed table communion to also include members of that particular denomination, okay? But only members of that particular denomination would be permitted to come to the table. So just thinking about some kind of famous examples, the Roman Catholic Church would be an example of closed table communion. You're really only supposed to participate in communion or the Eucharist if you are Roman Catholic at a Roman Catholic Church. Now, there's also some Protestant denominations that follow that as well. For instance, some of the Lutheran churches, like the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, but probably even more stridently so, the Lutheran Church Wisconsin Synod would be the one that is known most for its closed table communion. And that is because in some of these fellowships, they have either a transubstantiation view of the elements or they have what is called according to Lutheran theology, the consubstantiation view. Well, what do both of those have in common? They have a fairly literalistic interpretation of the elements actually becoming the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Lutheran incident, uh, it would be that the body and blood of Christ are in, with, among, and under the elements themselves. So both of those would have kind of a very literalistic understanding of what is happening at the Lord's Supper, namely that these elements are becoming something very different from they were just 20 minutes prior to the service or something like that. Okay, so for this reason, Roman Catholics and Lutheran theologians, they often do not invite other people to come to their table because presumably other worshipers, even if they're Christians, wouldn't be sharing those assumptions of what is happening in what the Roman Catholic Church would call the Mass or what the Lutheran Church might call the Eucharist. That is to say, other worshipers from other churches, other believers from other denominations would not share that understanding of transubstantiation or consubstantiation. And therefore, according to that particular view, they would be bringing themselves into the judgments that are described in 1 Corinthians 11, a passage that we're going to come to in just a few moments to look at, if you'll hang with me. So the reasons for closed table communion, I suppose, to interpret it charitably, would be to protect people from coming to the table and then incurring the wrath or the judgment of God for having participated in, in what they would think is an unworthy manner. Now, on the other side of that coin, let's fly to the other direction for just a moment here. Some churches, in fact, probably many churches, practice what is called open table communion, and that is that there's no restrictions whatsoever to come to the Lord's Supper. I've worshipped at a church like this quite a bit, especially in my college years. The chapel is a large non-denominational church. Thousands of people gather at that church for worship on Sundays, and whenever they do have communion, there is very little, if any, restriction imposed upon the gathered worshipers at all. Um, very few things are said by way of protecting the table, even from unbelievers. It's just assumed that people would come and that they should participate in the Lord's Supper, even if they're not Christians. Well, that's a position that I would pretty heartily disagree with myself. But it actually does have some historicity that I'd like to just unfold here for just a moment. Go with me back to the colonial church in the 1700s. Let's think about Jonathan Edwards and, in fact, his grandfather Solomon Stoddard, who was pretty famous for opening the table in what he referred to, or people referred to his view as a converting ordinance view. Now, back in these days, there was a little bit of a, of a problem because in the first generations of believers here in America, you had a pretty faithful and pious generation of believers who were baptized and who were ready to come to the Lord's table because they professed faith in Jesus Christ, okay? And what happened is that generation, of course, baptized their children. But then that second generation or the third generation isn't always as faithful as the first. And so some of those baptized members, they never actually professed their faith in Christ and were permitted to the Lord's table. So that's a problem in and of itself. 
But the problem gets even worse when that generation, the second generation, has children. Are they even permitted to baptize their children? So therein is the dilemma that is called the halfway covenant. Now, this is a great problem, and Solomon Stoddard had to think his way through it. And one of the ways that this problem could be negotiated is what is called the halfway covenant, which is to say that children, baptized children of baptized and communion members could also be baptized. And what that meant then is that they had to have a more permissive view of who could come to the Lord's table. And so Solomon Stoddard began to argue that perhaps the table should be open because it could be that people who are seeking the Lord might actually find themselves being converted through the participation in the Lord's Supper. And so the Lord's Supper somewhat modified its meaning from a kind of like a closed table perspective for those who were baptized and had professed faith and come to the elders and made their public declaration of their conversion. Now the table was opened up more to anyone who is not living in a scandalous lifestyle. And so that was Solomon Stoddard's sort of compromise. Now, obviously, he had to argue his way through that because not everybody thought that was a good idea, including Jonathan Edwards, his grandson. So at the Northampton Church, though Solomon Stoddard had virtually opened the table, Jonathan Edwards fought to actually close it back up only to those who had professed faith and conversion in Christ to their elders. And Ironically, that's actually what got Jonathan Edwards fired from the Northampton Church in 1750. Nevertheless, Solomon Stoddard's view of the converting ordinance or the open table became the predominant practice in what many churches would, what we would call many churches today, uh, broad evangelicalism. And especially since that church, the Northampton Church, was congregational in polity, Many churches, which were non-denominational thereafter, adopted Solomon Stoddard's open table view. So what would be the advantage of of each of those? Well, in closed table communion, of course, you're protecting the elements from a a worshiper who's coming in an unworthy manner. Again, remember, consubstantiation and transubstantiation is really underneath that argument for the most part. And then in the open table view, you have the problem of who's baptized and who's permitted to come to the Lord's table. So opening up the table for worshipers to come more freely seemed to be to some a more charitable way to go ahead and to distribute the elements and hope that people might even get saved, that they would come to Christ in a saving manner. Okay, so those would be your two extreme ends. You have your closed table and your open table communion. Now, uh, let me go ahead and argue for the via media, which would be the middle way. And that is what we call the fenced table in Reformed theology. To fence the table means that there is a, uh, there's a gate that opens and there is a gate that closes. That's why it's, it's fenced, a good fence. Uh, It keeps some out, but it also invites others in by virtue of the fact that the gate swings open and swings closed. So in Reformed theology, and especially in many or most Presbyterian churches, such as in the PCA, for instance, our table is neither open nor closed, but it's fenced. And so typically what we would do as we're celebrating the Lord's Supper is we would give a warning admonition and exhortation to whoever's gathered there that day. And usually we would say we open the fence then, we open the gate to anyone who is baptized, anyone who is a member of a local church, and then anyone who is not in scandalous lifestyle, which is to say in good standing in their local church. Okay, so those would be sort of the parameters that we would say, the gate swings open, come on in, celebrate the Lord's Supper with us. On the other hand, we close the gates to anyone who would not meet those particular standards. So if you're not a believer, of course, then you really ought not to participate in the Lord's Supper. If you are not baptized, then uh, again, that would be a pretty significant warning that we're wondering about your profession of faith. And certainly a person should be in good standing, meaning that they're not currently under the discipline of their own local church. So if somebody is visiting our church from another denomination, another or another PCA church, or yeah, even a a different Christian body, then we would ask them to to basically self-evaluate that rubric. Are you a believer? Are you baptized? Are you a member of a local church? Again, because membership implies discipline, the possibility thereof. And then, are you currently in good standing? If so, then we say that the gate swings open. But if those standards are not met, then we say, no, we're going to close the gate and we're actually going to fence you off from the Lord's table. Now, that's done in various ways in different Presbyterian churches. 
I know of one Presbyterian church in Ohio Presbytery that as the elders hand out the elements, they never let go of them, but they walk through the aisles. And if there's a person who's a visitor that they're not familiar with, they will ask them what church they are a member of. That may be a little bit off-putting to some, but it is nevertheless a way to protect people from participating in, in what might be thought of as an unworthy manner. Now, let's look at some of the reasons biblically why we should probably fence the table. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 here, an important text, and we're going to focus in on Paul's warning here that he gives, especially in verse 27 and following. Whoever, therefore, eats of the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So here we would agree with the closed table communionists that there is a really serious warning here. Um, There's a really serious warning here that we should not just... Uh, parade on up to the Lord's table as though um, there's no good reason why we might hold off on that because we certainly don't want to participate in the table in an unworthy manner. So with that, we agree with the, the Catholics and the Lutherans. So what do we do then? We ask the person to do some discernment. This is the fencing of the table. Let a person examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Well, practically speaking, that's pretty hard to examine the hearts of everyone else who's coming to the Lord's table on that particular day. So notice here that Paul really places the onus on the person to examine himself and ask themselves these things. Of course, we cannot look into the state of anyone else's heart and discern what actually lies there. But this is why we fence the table so that it's very clear that there's some really significant ramifications. If we don't, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now, what judgment could that possibly be? Well, Paul says here, that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Okay, so goodness, that sounds really scary, doesn't it? Well, yeah, all the more reason than to fence the table, okay? So let me give you kind of an analogy here that may be helpful to you, and that is that one of the things I like to think about when we fence the table at Gospel Fellowship PCA is the metaphor of the traffic light. So at a traffic light, you have red, you have yellow light, and you have a green light. So who would be a red light? Well, Absolutely, we would want to prevent somebody who's coming to the table who is an unbeliever. We do not agree with Solomon Stoddard that it is a converting ordinance. We think that the Lord's Supper is expressly for believers. Not only that, but we would put the red light up for anyone who's not a member of a local church. And again, why why is that? Is it because we're trying to be mean, tough guys or something like that? No, not that at all, but rather because... uh, If you're not a member of a local church, then you're not subject to the discipline of any particular ecclesiastical leadership. And to be a Christian means to unite yourself with the local church. Now, obviously, church membership and salvation are two different things, but the Venn diagram overlaps quite a bit, right? I mean, believers should be members of local churches. And so we would say red light if you're not a member of a local church. More to that same point, if you are a member of a local church, but you're under discipline, the discipline of that church, then again, red light, please do not participate. Don't come to us because your church isn't going to let you participate in the Lord's Supper. That would be wrong. That would be deceitful. And we definitely don't want you to do that. On the other hand, some people should probably think of the light as being yellow. It is a proceed with caution because maybe they're believers and maybe they are, um, you know, members of a local church. They're baptized. But they're in some serious sin right now. And even if the elders aren't aware of it yet, they may become aware of it. And you know in your heart what sin you have got going on. And if you're trying to get away with something nasty or something salacious or something that's uh, really repugnant to the law of God, then you should not be coming to the Lord's table, especially if you have every intention to carry on in that activity without repenting or without even asking for the Holy Spirit to help. Let me give you one other, one other yellow light uh, possibility is a person who does not have good repair with their relationships with other persons, okay? So maybe you have some relationships that are really damaged and you probably need to repent and ask for forgiveness. It'd probably be a pretty good idea to do that with your horizontal relationships with other people before you come to the Lord's table. But green light all the way if you love Christ, even if you're struggling with things, you know, there's something really helpful here in the um, in the Westminster Larger Catechism. I'm going to go to that text here. This is Larger Catechism 172. Of course, this is a Presbyterian thing, right? 
172, may one who doubteth of their being in Christ or of his due preparation come to the Lord's Supper. One who doubteth of his being in Christ or of his due preparation to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper may have true interest in Christ, though he be not yet assured thereof. And in God's account hath it, if he be duly affected with the apprehension of the want of it, and unfeignedly desires to be found in Christ and to depart from iniquity, in which case, because promises are made, and the sacrament is applied, appointed rather, excuse me, for the relief of, and even the weak and doubting Christians, let's highlight that here, he is to bewail his unbelief and labor to have his doubts resolved, and so doing, he may and ought to come to the Lord's Supper that he may be further strengthened. Okay, so in this case, the person who is doubting, the person who's struggling, the person who feels very weak, and yet they love Christ, and of course they desire to be found in Christ, and they desire to depart from their sin, this person should come to the Lord's Supper after all. What else is the Lord's Supper other than that ordinance by which we come to be nurtured and strengthened in Christ? So for Presbyterians, we think the best way to do it is neither to have a fully closed table, denomination or local church only, nor to have a fully open table like the non-denominationals, the evangelicals, and Solomon Stoddard's pattern, but rather a fenced table that carefully, um, carefully values the idea of self-examination, the examination of the heart, and meeting at least those basic standards of professing faith in Christ, being a baptized member of a local church in good standing, in which case come to the day table and be strengthened. All right. So thanks for uh, thanks for checking in to this video. That was a great question that somebody posed to me on Twitter. I really appreciate that. As always, I do love you lots, and we'll talk to you later.